Thanks very much, Tim. Appreciate that. Uh, so the Wellies are kind of a sister uh, brother organisation, I guess, to Unlimited Potential. We were set up about three years ago to really try and encourage uh, IT professionals to uh, migrate to Wellington and returning Kiwis to come back to Wellington with their IT skills. Um, we're here in a bit more of a social kind of um, area than Unlimited Potential in that we try and cover some of those awkward questions like where's a good place to live in Wellington, what's a good school to go to with your kids. Um, you know, this is a, is a pin, you know, um, and don't ask for kind of, I went down the market the other day and asked for six eggs, and that doesn't work either. So if you have friends who are in the UK or abroad in America and places like that, uh, please point them towards wellies.org.nz. Uh, Wellington City Council funds us, has just given us some money to build a Facebook application so that we can encourage more people to come along. And um, yeah, we'd love to hear from them and help them to settle in Wellington. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so I'd like to introduce you to our host for the evening, uh, Colin. Uh, Colin has been uh, Sort of fundamental in this, uh, New Zealand internet space. He was uh, involved in setting up Internet, internet New Zealand and also the, uh, installed the first government web server. Uh, his voice sounds familiar. He's also the technology sort of columnist uh, for Radio New Zealand's uh, 9 to noon session. I'd like to hand you over to Colin for the evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Wow, this is loud, isn't it? Welcome, everybody. I'm going to go and sit back here where you can't see me and maybe the, uh, the thing will stop feeding back so much. Is that any better? Yes! Cool, okay. Right, first of all, let's just talk about a few, uh, the usual housekeeping matters. Um, I know you've all got cell phones, I know I have. Um, please feel free to turn them on as loud as you like. Um, the first one to make an audible cell phone knows has to buy the uh, room around drinks, okay? Right, on we go from here. Just before we get going, I wanted to uh, just mention the, um, the Games, Geeks and Gadgets that is coming up shortly. Now, they're looking for volunteers for this. Your unlimited potential are very keen on having some extra helpers for this. It's going to be a, it's, 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 it's a big push and they uh, would need every help they can get. Please see somebody with the unlimited potential badge. That's uh, Tim would be a good starter there. If anybody else wants to make themselves known, wave. That's right, guys. Somebody, somebody wants to help on the Games, Geeks and Gadgets extravaganza that's coming up. Cheers. Okay, so um, one more thing. This is a gathering for people who have something to do with ICT and it's a gathering for people who have arrived in Wellington. How many people arrived in Wellington over 10 years ago? Let's have a show of hands. Okay, how many arrived between 5 and 10? Good. How many arrived between one and five? We've got a pretty fair spread here. How many have arrived in the last year? Okay, everybody else? Okay, hands up, keep, keep them up please. Everybody else? Seek these people out and indoctrinate them. Okay? <laughs> what we're going to do from here on, we have a panel of five fine, splendid people who are going to come up here and discuss the, the important questions of the moment. Like, when are the Hurricanes going to actually win the Super 14? <laughs> and we're going to bring them up here one by one and introduce them. So, first of all, I'm going to talk very briefly about what I'm doing here, and then we're going to bring up each and each the individual five. Uh, I'm a Wellingtonian by adoption, as I suspect most people are. Um, and I came here just about exactly 21 years ago to the day, got off a plane, found that the job I'd been recruited to didn't exist, was locked in a motel with nothing but a TV, sitting there feeling slightly despondent, wondering what the hell to do, and then watching this tiny country I'd just immigrated to taking on the world at rugby and beating it. That was quite, quite a cool experience. It's a shame it hasn't happened since, really, but never mind. <laughs> But um, anyway, things, things have gone on well from there, and you know, I sort of stayed here and kept eating, which is good, always a good thing. Uh, although sometimes too well, but never mind, you get that in New Zealand. But from now, I'm going to start um, by introducing the first member of our panel, who is Adam Shand. 
who I suspect is well known to many people here. Adam, um, Adam was born in England, um, but has uh, grown up moving backwards and forwards between New Zealand and California. I'm going to completely depart from the script here. Sorry, whoever wrote it. Uh, first of all, Adam has a quote from George Eliot on his personal homepage. Now, that's curious and interesting, and he's the only person I know who's done that. Secondly, Adam is living proof that size does matter. I mean, how many people out there can go out and say that I run the biggest supercomputer in the Southern Hemisphere, or maybe just in Wellington by now, but it's still damn big. Well done, Adam. Come on up. Welcome, Adam. Now, um, I'm... why Wellington? Okay, why did you come here? You got the lights on. Uh, well, for me, it was uh, a little different than some of the other people, I guess. Um, I got New Zealand citizenship from birth, so uh, for me, uh, moving to New Zealand was getting a job offer at Weta Digital and getting a chance to come work on the Lord of the Rings movies, so that was pretty attractive. And then also my family's here, so I was moving closer to, uh, closer to home for me. Uh, and then the other thing for me, it was as much as part of any of that, it was moving away from America, where at the time I was pretty upset with what some of my tax dollars were going towards. <laughs> Yeah, we can probably all sympathise with that. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if everybody who's moved to New Zealand from another country um, was at least partly for reasons um, associated with what their original country was doing. Certainly my decision was partly. Um, what were your first impressions of Wellington and of Wellingtonians? Um, well, I'd lived in New Zealand for a long time, but I'd lived down in Dunedin, so Wellington was a new city for me. I didn't really know what to expect. Um, my wife grew up in Alaska, so she knew absolutely nothing about what to expect. Um, our first impressions of Wellington were great. Um, it was this beautiful, small city with this rugged coastline. Uh, everybody we met was very friendly. We found that uh, there was a great art scene, there was lots of music, there was lots of cafes. Uh, we moved from, at the time, Portland, Oregon, which had always felt to me like it was a very small, big city. Portland's about the size of Auckland, you know, so it's a decent size. And what I loved about Portland was it was a big city that felt like a small city. And when I got to Wellington, to me it was a small city that felt like a big city. So you have all the advantages of a small city, being able to walk to work, being able to walk across town in 15 minutes, but you still get concerts, you still get shows, you still get, uh, you know, all that good stuff. And there's interesting work here. It certainly is. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Now time to meet our second panelist. Um, now, there's a glamour industry, a glamour tech industry out there, which is even more glamorous than ICT. Yes, it is possible. I'm not even talking about Peter Jackson weather workshops either. Sorry, Adam. But uh, I'm talking about biotech, and we have with us here today Professor Mark Hahn, PhD, and Bar, who is uh, from Victoria University of Wellington. And um, he was also founder, president, and CEO of HANA Biosciences Incorporated, and is on the board of another high-profile bioscience company. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Professor Mark Khan, who has moved from one Polynesian island to another, and now finds himself in the North Island of New Zealand. Hey, yes, the, same, the same questions, Mark. Why Wellington? Well, where else do you get to go to a pizza bar named Sin, right? Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark. Uh, I, we, my family and I made a decision to come here about, I guess, about eight months ago. Um, have not regretted it uh, since, for sure. Um, I am, I'm not sure where I am uh, politically. Somebody asked me who I wanted to win the uh, upcoming election in Hillary or Barack Obama or John McCain. And, my response to this uh, journalist was <clears throat> that I wanted John Key to win. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, but I'll just leave it there. Uh, so, <laughs> okay, there you go. But getting back to the, the question at hand, um, I have a six and an eight year old, and I think the first gift I would say that this um, wonderful country has given us is uh, you know, warm welcome, um, a real focus on children, and I really I think about that gift a lot, um, and I'm very grateful for it. And uh, my kids love going to school here. We live about three houses away from from there, and uh, and professionally, because of technology, um, I sit on two boards in the U.S. You know, nobody 
care sort of, um, I'm in pajamas and I'm doing things and uh, doing on investor calls actually this morning in pajamas. It was kind of cool. And, uh, uh, and, and working and it just seems like you can get the very best of everything. Um, I'm from Hawaii originally and it has a thread of Polynesia if you like and uh, we, I came most recently from San Francisco which uh, has many threads in common with, uh, with Wellington as well. So it has a lot of the best of both worlds and um, it's a great place to raise a family as well. Thank you, Mark. And um, what were your first impressions of Wellington and have they stuck? Oh, it's, uh, it's grown better and better, actually. Um, the southerlies have been uh, a little nippy to get used to. Too. It's not quite like Kauai, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's been wholly wonderful. And uh, once you get the hang of the weather, it's uh, very livable. And um, the art scene, on a personal level, it's an incredibly easy and, and welcoming place to, to be. And um, as an immigrant, I've always wanted to be a paranoid immigrant. Now I, now I am. And uh, uh, and uh, this is my chance, I guess. And uh, but in all sincerity, it's uh, it's a great place to work and a great place to live as well. Thank you, Mark. Now our, our next panelist, um, ladies and gentlemen, we have John Clegg. John is the CEO of Project X Technology. That's the um, that's the uh, company behind Trade Me Smacks and the um, founder of ZoomIn.co.nz. Uh, John is also uh, known apparently in India as Bruce and is, is known to go there to do cloak and dagger operations involving envelopes full of cash. I haven't quite got to the bottom of this one yet. Please welcome John Clegg. Now, uh, John, uh, why did you decide to go to Wellington? Well, as from my accent you might notice that I'm a local so uh, for me, it was coming back. Uh, I spent uh, seven years abroad and uh, came back to Wellington in 2003 and was looking at opportunities to do things. And what struck me about Wellington, having left as an engineer, as coming back as someone who was doing business, was the fact that there was a lot of things happening. Um, this was the days that Rod Drury was still just Rod, he wasn't uh, Mr. Aftermail or anything like that, he was beavering away at those sort of things. Sam Morgan had yet to hit big time, so you know, that sort of industry really, really appealed to me. Um, having worked on, in uh, London, Australia, South Africa, India, all over the place, what I like about Wellington is it's close, it's proximity. Both in the people and in the environment, you can meet a lot of really, really talented people here in, in, in a close environment and actually get to know them very, very well. So that's why uh, one of the key factors um, that I came here, I was also close to my family, uh, which is down in Lower Hutt. So I had to get a passport to go back and see them in Lower Hutt. <laughs> Thanks, John. And um, did you find that people said, uh, oh, I love, and didn't assume you'd never been away? Or did they say, who the hell are you? Uh, How did it work? Uh, when I came back, it was like, I um, come from a different planet, so um, I effectively became an immigrant. When I came back, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I just um, literally spent five years doing online auctions, um, working 100-hour weeks and doing all this crazy stuff. I decided you know, I needed a break, uh, so I thought I'd go and do some contracting. I went and go and talk to the contract agents, and they're like, you know, you've got experience in India. Mm, um, we can't validate that. We're not going to be able to do anything about that, so I couldn't actually find a job. Uh, and it wasn't until I sort of started persuading one of my friends at Weta, he says, you must have something for me over at Weta. And he says, yeah, sure, come over and do some stuff over there. So I went over to Weta. Um, I mean, it's Wellington is about networks. And that's one of the key things that, that really stuck with me. As I went away, you know, I was an engineer. I knew all the people in the tech scene, but I didn't know anybody when I came back. So it was sort of like, like who the hell are you? So that was one of the things. Um, but it's it's... A sort of superficial thing, once people get to know you, it's much, much better. Thanks, John. Maybe maybe Wellington is small enough that a critical mass of the networking here is, is, is comprehensible. So, you know, if you know a few, like a couple of hundred people, maybe a few hundred people, you can know enough to get going. Maybe that's what it is. I think you only need to know about a dozen. 
<laughs> yes, I'm not sure how many of that particular dozen I know, but... Anyway, next, the next guest, ladies and gentlemen, our next victim, is Brian Colon, who has been with Silverstripe for over a year, and he's uh, recently become the CEO. Um, Brian's um, got uh, a lot of experience, mostly in Silicon Valley, and he tells me that he has an unhealthy relationship with the web. I see. I haven't really asked for any details on that. Please welcome Brian. And Brian, um, the standard questions, why Wellington? Um, several reasons. Uh, the first one, I suppose, is, is that George Bush isn't in charge here. <laughs> uh, that is what makes you think that? <laughs> Right, with the spy satellites and the shalana, yeah, I know about that. So. Um, that was one of the reasons. Another one of the reasons was that uh, Wellington is really what I consider a small version of San Francisco. Um, I really do enjoy San Francisco, the people, the technology, the geographic environment, and multiculturalism. Uh, these are all things I loved about San Francisco. The problem is that San Francisco is in America. So my wife and I were looking for a smaller version of San Francisco where we could do some new things and really have an impact. And we looked all over the planet, and frankly, Wellington just fit the bill to a T. So that's why Wellington. And um, what were your first impressions? I mean, have you have your expectations been met in that sense? Um, actually, they've been exceeded. Um, we were we were welcomed very warmly here in here in Wellington. I mean, I show up off the boat. And I got a job at uh, at three months. Mark Pascal, I have to say gave me my first gig in Wellington and uh, you know it was it was really awesome I mean he didn't really know me from from Adam and, and so he really opened up and said yeah come on join our company and that's how my career in Wellington got started um, so you know that was just an example but there's been heaps of other examples where everybody's been very friendly very welcoming uh, much friendlier in on the whole than in the States and and people are just nicer here I mean it's just true. I, I don't know what it is, but it's it's absolutely true. So, um, yeah, we've the expectations were actually exceeded. Yeah, that's cool. Thank you. And um, our final guest for this evening, uh, Glenn Andert, is um, he, he's at pains to point out that his name does actually rhyme with dirt. Uh, he uh, kind of went aground in Wellington after sailing around the South Pacific for three years. I mean, how many of us can say that? <laughs> That's so cool. Um, before that, he was into Silicon Valley startups. Oh, all the boring things we've all done, right? Okay. And uh, he's, uh, he's looking to connect. And he also rides motorcycles and raids small villages. Please welcome Glenn. <laughs> That's right. You guys are going to have to move up a little and make some space. So, uh, Glenn, uh, was there any navigation involved, or was Wellington just where the boat happened to wind up? Well, um, a year ago, I met a wonderful Kiwi lady, and she happens to live here. So, uh, <laughs> that was the big draw for me in Wellington, and it was, it was a very good draw. Good, good, good. And, um, well, your first in tell us about your first impressions, and tell us... Um, Actually, with probably some details we don't need to hear, but, but uh, you tell, tell us about your first impressions and, and, and your expectations and how they've been met, if they have been. Well, I'd second um, that um, New Zealanders are a lot more friendly than uh, people in California. Um, so I've been invited to barbecues at people's houses that I barely know, and, um, and the, the officials in immigration here are far friendlier than, than anybody I've ever met in a in the government department in the United States. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm delighted with um, the, the people that I've met here. It's been, it's been great. Thanks a lot for that, Glenn. I'm, uh, I'm going to pass that on to uh, one or two of the people in the Department of Labor, but I'm sure we'll be interested to hear that point. So uh, you'll probably notice this, and it's a, it, it's a personal observation, but it's probably uh, probably most people would agree that it's it's pretty fashionable to beat up on public servants uh, right across New Zealand. But uh, there are actually a lot of people who are trying really hard. Okay, um, maybe we can move on to the questions for the panel now. We we have a a list of pe questions that's been um, developed from uh, an intensive evaluation of user feedback, um, a large extent of Gallup polling, and I rather think Tim sticking his finger in the air and. Wondering what the hell people want to know about. 
So first of all, the first question is about Wellington versus the world. How does the Wellington scene compare with Northern Hemisphere pubs? Oh no, I'm sorry, that says hubs. Okay. Uh, anybody want to start on this one? Adam, you had it. You've had a while off. So I don't think there's too many surprises here. I mean, from my point of view, the big, the big struggle with uh, working in New Zealand is just how far away New Zealand is from the rest of the world. You know, you're used to working on the west coast of the states. There's an amazing diversity of technical, business, everything, um, support, resources available, you know, next door. Uh, and sometimes that's a struggle working in New Zealand, even working at Weta Digital, you know, where you get a lot of attention. It can sometimes be hard to find the resources that you need. Uh, on, on the flip side, I really like that that uh, that separation forces New Zealanders to be independent, to figure things out for themselves, work out how to do things, and just get on with it in general. Uh, so the difference is, I think between the hubs, it's really not that much. The big difference is scale. You know, Wellington is a little place. And, and that's what I love about it, but that does come with its own set of challenges. I'll take it on from a completely different vantage point. Um, I guess come, come at this in, in my industry in life sciences, thinking about life sciences, um, ICT, and globalization of capital markets, and are there limits? And um, we just finished a study that, that showed that, you know, there's, right now, the genomic, to, to do the first human genome costs about uh, $3 billion in 10 years. Today on the web, you can go on and get up to 23andMe, the, um, the wife of uh, one of the Google co-founders established a company where you can get your, your, your genome and all of its implications for about $999. So you talk about Moore's Law, about how the balkanization of information is leading us to you know, paths unknown, and how capital chases good ideas. I don't think there's really any limits if we think in terms of high value added, in terms of intellectual property based businesses, and our connectivity to the world, because the world needs great ideas, and they scale very well. I'll just give one specific example. Um, there's a supercritical extraction technology. You guys might think, well, you know, what's that? Well, New Zealand blue cod is about $26 a kilo, and it's great. Um, the heads of New Zealand blue cod go to waste right now. By extracting, just a simple method of extracting the micronutrients, omega-3, 6, and 9 fatty acids, those go for about $450 a kilo. So if you think about how the world's going, how intellectual property is, is touching the things that we're good at and how it can have an impact on value-added industries because obviously we're not going to compete in by, by low-cost labor. You know, what you guys are doing, bringing information technology and enabling all of these other industries is right on the sweet spot of making distance irrelevant. That's cool. Thank you, Mark. Something there that uh, gave me a pause for thought about the, the, the genome and the... Um, the sinking cost of sequencing it. Uh, how long before that gets to be the biometric in our passport? I'll just leave that one hanging, okay? Uh, Glenn, do you want you want to pick this one up? Well, I'd also second the um, the bit about I've always loved San Francisco and actually I always wanted to live there. I, I live 50 miles south of there, and. Um, Wellington reminds me of San Francisco. Um, it's a really cool place, and it doesn't have car, 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 like San Francisco does. So I'm really excited to be here. And it's hard for me to compare the two places right now. I know a lot about where I've been, but I don't know a lot about where I am right now. <laughs> but um, so far, this is a pretty awesome place, and I'm looking forward to getting connected. Awesome. Um, I think there's, there's the obvious things like the fewer people and, and the problems of not being able to get Amazon shipments, you know, real quick and easy and with, you know, practically zero shipping fees. Um, that's the obvious stuff, but it's also an opportunity. I mean, there's a lot of innovation that's really happening here in New Zealand uh, across a lot of industries. And to me, the lack of, of, of um, you know, comparative size with some of the American hubs or global hubs is actually an advantage because we have access to more of the powers that be here in New Zealand and especially here in Wellington. This is one of the things that actually attracted me to Wellington from San Francisco, um, Big Fish Small Pond. 
Um, there's a lot going on here in terms of innovation, and to me, that's uh, it's something that you look for in bigger hubs, but it's easier to come by here in Wellington. Um, related to this is ego. Um, the ego in New Zealand is much, much, much less than the egos that you see in business in Silicon Valley. And I think it's a, it's a numbers thing, it's a competition thing. Everybody, there's so many people and there's so much competition with other people and the egos and inflation and blah. We've got, we got a $100 million valuation on our, on our company that has zero prospects of revenue for the next six years. And, you know, I mean, you can, how does that not get to your head? So. Um, so I think the lack of uh, a strong venture capital community here in New Zealand is actually a good thing. So some of the things that some people may consider disadvantages about New Zealand, I think are actually advantages. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I'll start the job. Um, my experience, I'm going to talk about London. Um, I spent a couple of years there. So um, I think one of the differences here in New Zealand um, compared to the, sort of the European countries where I spent my OE, is um, we work harder. Uh, I don't know if anyone's actually been to uh, England or those sort of things. You look at the Antipodeans, they tend to be working harder. But actually that's not just Antipodeans, it's immigrants. Immigrants in any country work harder uh, because they're focused. They want to know what they're, they're doing. So. Um, when I come back here and I was thought, well, you know, is that true? Do we actually work harder? I was surprised that we actually do. Um, people are motivated here because they actually think that there's an opportunity for them to do something. So we, have, we tend to play around a bit more. There's a lot more R&D. People are playing around in the garage. They're doing things. They're having a go. They're trying to figure out how to make things tick. And, um, you know, we've got a lot of famous inventors and a lot of famous stuff from basically people giving it a go. You know, we've got homeboy hero, Sam Morgan. He thought, you know, what well, I needed some way to, to sell my heater. So, you know, that's the way he, he got it sorted out. So I think that comparative to uh, the Northern Hemisphere, I think we've got a lot of things going on because we can actually get out there and do stuff. And, and because of that, because we make it happen, like Adam said, we are quite inventive, um, we actually achieve a lot more uh, than we uh, possible. But then we need a lot of challenges. We've got to actually get it to market, and that's one of the challenges here. Thanks, John. Um, certainly been my own observation that uh, people who have emigrated have already self-selected. You, you see what I mean? People who have emigrated, therefore people who have arrived in a place, have already self-selected as the ones who have actually had the... Um, or whatever it is to get up and move somewhere, and that in itself is something. Especially more so, I think, from the big old countries like the one I come from and like the one many of these gentlemen come from, where uh, there is not really a, a culture, there's not really a co of getting up and moving out, to be like there is in New Zealand, to that. Anyway, moving on, we're, we're going to finish these next two questions and work our way around, and then, uh, then I might throw it open to the floor and seek a question or two before I go back onto the script. So. So start thinking about things you might want to ask the panel. Um, the next question on the list here is, uh, do Wellington or New Zealand have any attractive qualities that other Northern Hemisphere hubs don't have? Now, we've, we've already mentioned quite a few of those in the past question, but if, uh, if, if you've got any further ideas on that one, seize the mic now off me. So before I came out here this afternoon, I sent out an email to one of the what a mailing list saying, so why do you guys all live here? Why do you guys stay? Um, there's obviously a lot of foreigners at Weather. There's a lot of people that have come and have been here for many years. Uh, I've got sort of maybe 20 responses back, and almost all of them had to do with quality of life. People love the easy access to the outdoors. People like the fact that they could walk to work. People like the fact that uh, there were sensible gun and nuclear weapon laws. People like the politics in general was pretty sensible. Um, people like that the government was fairly accessible. Um, you know, but no one really had anything to say about the ICT industry. What pe people were moving here and staying here because the quality of life was good for them and their families. And I think that, that was the main thing that I took away from that. Thank you. Anyone else want to pick up on this question? Do you want to take Colin's beer? Oh, yeah. Right, yeah. Well, I see some finger pointing on my right here. No? Can we ask people to move down the bar? Now, what is down the bar? Do you mean towards us, Brian? 
And just so we, there's a few people at the back who are having trouble hearing what people are saying here. There's a few, there's a few, we can't because it starts feeding back, but um, there's a few chairs free at the front so we can, if people want to come and we can um, get you seated kind of closer. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. But I haven't seen as many people in one place for three years. <laughs> you come to up events more often. Thank you, Glenn. Um, we've got another question here, which is, what are, your, what are your observations about what Wellington could do to attract more highly skilled ICT people? Uh, there's no unspoken assumption there that that's a good thing, but maybe we better not unpack that at this stage. Uh, let's start with you, John. Um, I think that one of the biggest problems you have in New Zealand is actually telling people. Uh, we have a lot of talented people just in this room, um, but nobody knows what we do. Um, Silverstrike guys have been really good at getting out there and telling the world about their great product, um, but a lot of us don't do that. And that's a real, real problem because, um, you know, I, I run a summer of code program for internships and we're trying to get students into companies where they're going to make a difference, not into government departments, not into the big cubicle farms, where they're going to go and make a difference. But to do that, we have to try and attract them into the firms that are actually doing cool stuff. And there is cool stuff happening in Wellington. There's a lot of it, but nobody knows. So that's, you know, it's my fault and a whole bunch of other people here that we're too busy running our businesses. We've got to get out there and we've got to tell people. Because if we help tell people, then that money will come in, you'll actually get uh, investment and all that good stuff. I'm just going to exercise a chair's right to reply on that one and say, uh, Kiwis are also modest, you know? And, and, and I'm just paraphrasing what you said here, John, right? You know? I mean, those of us from Europe, we, we're used to, you have to yell a bit to get, you, get yourself known above the crowd. I mean, I mean, we're nothing on the Americans, right? And as for the Australians, well, Okay, Brian. Yeah, this is a this is a really good question because as a growing company, we we struggle with this a lot. Um, uh, frankly, I think a lot of it comes down to, like you said, telling your story, and advertising, and marketing. Um, immigration consultants here in New Zealand who want to go and attract uh, immigrants from America, they actually go and they advertise in America. <laughs> Crazy. So, so, so he asked me this. One guy asked me, "So, where, where should I advertise in San Francisco to talk about New Zealand and immigrating to New Zealand?" Well, frankly, I think you know Wellington should do the same thing to attract ICT people. Advertise in Silicon Valley. Talk about the great things that are going on in the ICT industry here in Wellington and here in New Zealand. It's a marketing issue. Just make people aware of what it is that you're doing. There, again, there's awesome stuff going on here. It's just a matter of making it known in the right places. Um, so I think advertising, marketing could be done. I think um, there's also uh, all kinds of things like innovation tax credits. Let's say that, um, let's say that uh, the government offers some kind of tax credit for companies that create stuff, you know, in some kind of technical fashion. And there's some, you know, relatively low bar, but still a bar there that you have to jump over in order to qualify for this credit. That would be awesome, you know. Um, money. A lot of it's about money. How do you attract? good, highly skilled people. You pay them more money, and that's always hard. So you need better ways of being able to pay more salaries. Tax cuts is, is one nice way to do that. Incentives from the government is, is one good way to do that. Um, but again, if it were up to me, it would center around focusing on innovation and getting that concept of innovation out to the world. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, there might be some value into tapping into the you know recruiting scene over in Silicon Valley as well. If you're a small company over there and you want talent, um, they just don't you know fall on you. You've actually got to go out and steal them from other companies and stuff like that. So um, you know, getting tapped into that scene there would probably help a lot. Thanks, Mark. Sure. Um, if you look at the literature on how hubs start. And what we're talking about is how to have a competitive hub. What it tells you clearly is that there's no one way, there's no one right way to do it. But what um, what it what the difference is is not in strategy. It's not in um, you know sort of approach. But it, it turns out that support services, meaning the uh, availability of, of venture capital, for example, or links with um, academic institutions where innovation is happening, 
have a huge difference. It make huge differences in terms of well, what wealth is created. And um, if you if you think about the fact that we have seven VCs and most of the deals that are done now are not syndicated, versus Silicon Valley where you have even the largest funds insist on having three to five players in them so that the B round, the C round are easier to access for the company as they scale. I think there's some good lessons learned there. Um, if you have access to capital, you have new venture creation. If you have new venture creation, it attracts high quality jobs and good paying jobs. And uh, so I think the front end is getting angel and venture capital right. And I think that's starting uh, with things like uh, Angel HQ and some of the other venture networks that are, are starting to bubble. And then the second part of it would be um, facilitating the good ideas that are in New Zealand and getting um, international venture capital deployed because it, it really is boundaryless. It has no boundaries. You think about the largest VC fund here in New Zealand is actually largely Swiss, for example, in, in Auckland. There's no boundaries to money. The question is, can you learn how to access, can you learn how to access institutional capital to accelerate and scale your businesses? Uh, so I would say two things. The first is keep New Zealand beautiful. People are here because they want to live here. And that's, that's not just the standard clean, green New Zealand advertising thing. That's sensible urban planning. That's, you know, Wellington's a great city to live in. Auckland's a crap city to live in, right? Urban planning has a part to do with this. Um, you know, this stuff is important. Uh, you know, all of that stuff, keep it livable. Keep, you know, one of the reasons Wellington's great to live in is because there's a really vibrant art scene, right? To have a vibrant art scene, artists who aren't making a lot of money have to be able to afford to live here, right? There's a lot of issues like this which are part of the reasons why we're all here. Uh, the other thing is I think we need to invest in infrastructure, right? There was a lot of conversation at a conference I was at before about, you know, the telecom monopoly, good broadband services, being able to host uh, your business in New Zealand, not having to take that business out to Australia or the States, right? So we're pouring money out of the country because it's too expensive to host services in New Zealand. Um, I read in the paper the other day that we're considering selling off Vector. What the hell? Right? Why are we doing that? Right? I run it, or I work for a big company that is very, very reliant on the public power infrastructure, and we're selling it off to a company we're owned by another country. Why? Why are we doing that? Right? Why do we keep talking about selling off infrastructure, which is critical to the to the success of New Zealand? I just think that's nuts. Another source might be, um, and I'm just making this up, but. Um, you know, you go to we all we go. You, you go to um, some really good universities in the United States, and um, you bring some people over here and have them work as interns in companies over here. So they see how great Wellington is. They have opportunities here. They learn to like it here, and they come back when they're done, or you know, other places in the country as well. Um, it's easier to get you know people that aren't already attached and have roots to come to New Zealand than it is people that do have roots. That's good. So we have. Uh, I'm going to try to summarize that, which is kind of difficult because some of it was conflicting, but it was all really good. Keep, keeping Wellington beautiful. I can, see, I can see a hand being waved back there. How loud could you shout, sir? Oh, well, loud enough. Um, I'd like to add my two pennies worth to the last, last statement because it's been going on my brain for a long time. What can Wellington do to attract more ICT people? Educate the companies. Educate the companies that it's not that hard to employ people from overseas. Educate the companies that a working holiday visa is a good entry point into the, com into the country. Educate them that it isn't hard to get a working visa for two years. It's a very simple thing. A lot of New Zealand companies don't realize that. A lot of, a lot of New Zealand companies don't actually understand how easy it could be for ICT people to come here. And companies, of course, are composed of people. So what we have to do is hit the people in the companies who make those kind of decisions, who have those kind of attitudes. I don't know if we have any ideas on that, but that's, that's, that's where we've got to go. And of course it's all about venture capital. There's, there's not enough venture capital and there's way too much venture capital and that's cool. That's, a, that's probably another topic we should unpack. <laughs> so God wins by two falls to a submission. Sorry, that's an old Monty Python joke, don't worry, you're, you're, you're too young. 
and quite and quite a lot of it is about education. Yes. Uh, thank you. Anyway, um, I'd like to take a question from the floor. Have we have we got a? Thank you for your contribution, sir. Have we, have we got another question that, that the panel would like? You'd like the panel answered. Are you are you are you waving, Stephen? I can barely see you. There's a light behind you. Broadband, so called. Ah, yes. Is that a question or a statement or, 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 or a joke? <laughs> it's a question. How does the how, how does the, um, the internet service here compare with uh, compare with overseas? And is it a um, is it a, a great advantage? Okay, let's start with Adam. <laughs> Um, Performance-wise, it's actually not that different, I don't think, but it is really expensive. From a consumer point of view, these days, it's actually not bad. Um, from a business point of view, especially if you're trying to host, uh, you know, trying to host a very popular website, um, if you're trying to do what we do, which is deliver films, which can be a couple terabytes of data over the internet, um, from that point of view, it is unbelievably, ridiculously expensive. I, it, I mean, when I first came to Weta and discovered how much we were paying per gigabyte to send traffic to the United States, I cried. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it was and still is actually cheaper for us to copy a reel of film onto hard drives, fly somebody business class to L.A. with the drive in a briefcase, drop it off and get on a plane and fly back than it is to send it by the Internet. That's nuts. Uh, you're going to pass off this one. Go bad. Glenn? Well, I'll tell you, compared to Fiji and Tonga, it's really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you it's even better than Easter Island. Okay, right. Um, the main thing that I see is the uh, the traffic caps are, are really egregious here. Um, again, from a consumer perspective, it's actually it's not so bad, the speeds and such with, with DSL. And unbundling is a step in the right direction, and, and there's lots of stuff going on, on there, um, which is similar to what happened in, in 96 in the States with the deregulation of the telecom in, in the States, and, and that spawned arguably the one of the booms, the Internet boom in the States was, was that event. So that is cool. Um, so for me, it's, it's the traffic caps, which is completely unrealistic. Um, you know, paying per gigabyte basically for, for the traffic is, is just terrible. I don't know what can be done. It's, it's a matter of what, opening up the Southern Cross a little bit more and exposing some more of the fibers. I don't know, but it's, it's the data caps for me that just is completely unrealistic. Uh, for me, it would be uh, peering. So obviously, the website's here, you've got to get connected now. But for whatever reason, Telecom and Telstra cut off Wellington. Wix got disconnected. Now there's a company down the road called Trade Me, and they were forced to down pay you know, a, a large sum of money every month so that they could send their stuff to Auckland and back. So um, pairing is really, really important. I mean, if we're going to move forward, and then we've got iTunes downloads of movies and all that sort of stuff, then we're going to have to have really, really good internal infrastructure. So that means good pairing, um, proper data content, um, uh, was it DNCs? CDNs. C CDNs, content distribution networks, right, I'll get it right. Uh, and that sort of thing, um, but to me, uh, broadband is a small tip of the iceberg. We should be concentrating on mobile data rates. Like, we all have mobile phones. We, have, we probably all have broadband as well, but everybody in New Zealand has mobile phones, most people in New Zealand, and we're paying ridiculous amounts. So to put it in perspective, I was in India in September, and um, it was 17 pesa uh, minutes. That equates to 0 0.6 cents a minute. Okay, so that's the life of what it is over in India. I did connect at 9 kilobytes per second on Indian dial-up, so that, that was a bonus. But, uh, you know, we've got to be doing things on mobile because we're paying far too much for our mobile services and that comes down to our duopoly uh, incumbent. So hopefully Telstra, which is supposed to enter the mobile space, will be coming soon and we can actually get some real services. Yes, um, on that last point, I think um, probably both of these stem from the fact that we have a small market with a small number of commercial players in and that uh, until now we've had two networks that have studiously avoided competing with each other. I'm talking about mobile here because they've used different technologies. Of course, telecom's been forced to move to GSM and we keep hearing there's going to be a third entrance, so uh, 
Even with Rhoda locking up its phones, uh, we should be able to hopefully get somewhere on that one. I hope so, anyway. Anyway, um, let's move to another question now. There's a gentleman out there who's been uh, frantically waving. I hear a lot of you commenting on the ICT investment as far as broadband goes, but nobody's mentioned the potential for making it a utility, such as they've done in Sweden and other European countries where internet has worked quite successfully and it becomes a service which everybody is eligible for at a reasonable rate. And that doesn't seem to be something which has ever come up. And I just wonder why. Just, uh, just, 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 just unpack that a little. What do you mean by the difference between a utility and, say, the service that we get at the moment? Okay, so rather than the City Council spending a lot of money on CityLink and selling it, you spend ratepayers' money, you build a network, which you then rent out to providers. So that's people like Telstra, that's people like Telecom, that, um, and all the other providers who are keen on the unbundling. But then, rather than selling it off, you make it a rentable service. So it's just like the power lines. It's maintained by the council, but the actual facility, you've got to choose a provider who gives you the best facilities that you can get. So you pay for what you get, but there's a lot of competition, and the actual hardware is maintained through something which isn't based on competition. Right, so this is about uh, maintaining public ownership of the natural monopoly component. Yeah. Uh, somebody want to pick that one up? Adam, you <laughs> go for it. So I personally think that's a fabulous idea. Uh, I mean, I think it comes down to one thing. You either have to choose that New Ze decide that New Zealand's big enough to support multiple companies actually competing for our business, or you have to decide that it's not big enough to, to support multiple companies actually competing, and you have to set up a state-owned monopoly. Otherwise, you end up in the situation we have now where you have one company that just pretty much does whatever they want. And that's how we are where we are. I mean, that, that said, everybody gives telecom a pretty hard time, but, you know, having lived in the States, U.S. Worst and Quest was hardly a pleasure to deal with. In a lot of ways, you know, telecom is a breath of fresh air. <laughs> you going to comment on that one, Mark, whilst I, whilst I scrape myself off the floor? No? Clean? Go on. Yeah, I think a lot of this comes down to, um, I look at it as commodification. You know, once something is commodified enough, then it can become a utility. You know, water, electricity, things like that are the common examples. I do agree that we need to push for a future where people view, consumers view Internet as something as common and it needs to be as reliable as when they go in, they flick on the switch when they walk into a room. That's exactly where we need to be going. So, yeah, I completely agree we need to push for that. Um, You've got commercial interests who are currently competing, so I think it would have to be a really, really big event. And I don't know what that event, event would be to where the change would, would actually happen. Um, don't know. It would probably take people getting pissed off enough about something, about some aspect of the current system, to warrant uh, the government coming in and saying, right, we're going to make this a utility now. We're going to do as you suggested. Um, I've got a couple of things to add. Is one is, from a grassroots level, um, Adam's been involved in a, a free wireless out in Portland. Um, there is actually a free wireless project that's currently uh, in operation here in Wellington. We want to make ubiquitous free wireless across all the Wellington CBD. So that's free the net ATRO. Rod Drury, Trey me, myself, a whole bunch of people were all involved. And it means um, we're wanting to actually give everybody access. Now there, there's going to be some lot of hard stuff to figure out and make it happen. But we've actually got uh, our money, City Lincoln coming to the party. There's uh, some negotiations going on um, with the council. Um, but it's going to happen. Um, it's because we want to make it happen. All of you know that when you want to go to a meeting and if you've got an iPod or whatever, it's, uh, PDA, you're trying to get out there, uh, you want to get that thing happen. So we're trying to show that from the grassroots, the business community are going to say, no, we don't accept the services that are out there at the moment. We're going to see if we can do something. So we are actually doing it. And um, it will take time. Uh, we've had a few months already playing around. But um, you know we're trying to figure out how to make it happen, so that that's that's really good. Um, on the broadband front, uh, you know it should be a utility, but you know if you are old enough to remember how telecom were like back in 1987, then you might be asking yourself a few questions. 
So, you know, um, hopefully we can learn a few things and, and, and we can get better, but, you know, we've got to make sure that it is an improvement. And it uh, always worries me when we get the government involved because, um, you know, you're getting a whole lot of high-priced consultants coming in telling them this is the way to do it, that's the way to do it. They can't even figure out how much it's going to cost to give us uh, decent broadband. You know, $1.5 million has been thrown around, but no one really knows where that number's come from. Just when I think about where broadband has gone in this country, I almost cry about it, frankly. I think it would be 1997 that I had full speed, both directions, uncapped broadband as part of the original telecom trial, and we were one of the, possibly the first country in the world to start delivering that to real customers, and since then, we have gone backwards. I can see somebody signaling back there, gentlemen by the light. And I speak up, please. Definitely that was the case. Um, full speed broadband at 8 megabits per second both ways. You couldn't have got a lot much better than that. And um, you know, having been involved with that and then going back into that telco industry was, was going backwards. I'm glad it's not just my, uh, my, my softened brain, that, but the, the other people who remember this really happened like that as well. Have we got another question from the, from the audience, please? Hello, in the uh, corner over here, I can see. Um, yeah, I'd just like to switch perspective to uh, education uh, for a while, um, because uh, you're talking about my, migration of uh, people. Yes. Um, but um, recently, messages um, closed down the software engineering or did a science unit in Wellington and shifted it all up to Thomas and North. Now, um, with uh, numbers of enrollment to computer science dropping, shouldn't we do something about this? What can be done to sort of improve this connection with the media? This is, this is... This is a really good question, and thank you for bringing this one up, because, because I, almost this is an elephant in the living room. I mean, this is, this is actually... It, it, it's, it's wider than Massey as well. I mean, this is about um, decline of numbers going into computer science, tertiary education. And, and to me, that should be a concern to everybody here. Um, I'm going to uh, throw the mic at you, John, because yeah, you look well qualified to, to comment on this. <laughs> Vic, any <you> graduate? <laughs> yeah, for those who don't know, um, I run the New Zealand Summer of Code, which is an internship scheme which currently operates in Wellington and uh, I've had various approaches to take this um, nationally. Um, I can relate to, I, I was part of the, the, well, in the last six months when Massey decided that they'd shut the scheme down, that was after we placed a dozen Massey students in Wellington companies. So it's very, very disappointing um, that this is happening. We have to actually go out there and support uh, ICT in the in industry. And as I said before, one of the key things is actually letting the students know that there's good companies out there, that there's great work, um, there's opportunities to do world-class technology and innovation in Wellington. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we, as an industry, have to step up. Other industries, engineering, architecture, all these things do internships, rigorous programs where people come out. I mean, these kids, they don't know what they don't know, right? So we've got to actually do that. Now, people say the university's job is to make them ready for my company. They've got to know .NET, they've got to know PHP, they've got to do Ruby on Rails. But the universities say we're here to teach fundamentals. So um, we've got a conflict. So the only way this is going to happen is we as an industry go to the universities and we help. And that's what we've been trying to do with Summer of Code. It's very hard. Uh, it requires a lot of effort from us because we're all busy. You know, um, all the companies in Summer of Code were so busy doing this stuff over Christmas time and trying to mentor people, but it was been a success. We've been done it for two years. We're going for a third year this, uh, this year. Uh, we want to make it happen. I think it comes down to uh, everybody in their own company thinking about what can we do to actually make it better because if we don't support our students coming in and make better graduates, then we have to go overseas. Um, and then, you know, that's a good thing, so we're bringing people in and talent to mentor and people, but we're not looking after our own. So, you know, um, otherwise, there are startup companies that can't afford to go overseas. 
you know, the only way you can do is go and get local people. So we should have local and mixed international to give us that vibrant community, give us that culture, give us those experience. So what John's saying here really is we can all identify the problem, but go out and fix it. Right. There was, there was one thing that I noticed uh, a couple years ago. I got really excited when I saw a, a little thing in the paper about how Vic was starting a software engineering program. And uh, for me, that's, that's near and dear to my heart because my, my degree is in software engineering. Um, this is the a next logical step beyond computer science when you talk about the evolution of an industry. I think it's really, really awesome that local universities are recognizing this and they're offering full-on software engineering programs uh, to students here in New Zealand. To me, this is an indicator of the evolution of the industry in New Zealand. Um, for Silverstripe's part, you know, totally agree. I mean, we go out and we speak at Vic about uh, design and about technology and industry, and we just talk about what we do around the office, and, and they love it. So the kids can see examples of what it actually is to study this stuff and then how you apply that in the real world. Um, and also Silverstripe's been part of the uh, Google Summer of Code and, and your Summer of Code too, so we, we are firm believers in this. And so I think the, the answer is, is that there is no single answer. You just try to approach it from a number of different angles and uh, try to promote the industry. Yeah, I also think it's very important about this um, internship thing because in the States, kids don't come out of uh, university knowing how to work either. Um, and it really is industry's job there to take people, you know, out of college and, and really train them on how they're going to function in the business environment. And you have to have people here, you have to have good people here, and, and the capital will follow, I think. I'm just going to, uh, just I was babysitting a managing, management job and uh, building a, um, a programming team for somebody. I hired a guy who was uh, fresh out of the, um, the Massey University um, programming school effectively and uh, he was an immigrant he'd come here he'd done his degree we picked him up for uh, I think he'd probably worked for 50 percent of what my client paid for him and um, gave him his first job and nothing much happened he spent ages and six weeks later suddenly the client the declared himself 120 percent happy with what this guy had produced and the other programmers were suddenly learning from him and uh, he basically overturned the way the whole place worked. So yeah, that was good value. If anything is that, uh, you know, John, you said that uh, the universities don't feel that it's their job to turn out students that um, have the skills that you think that are important. And to me, this is always one of the distinctions. I mean, I kind of agree with the universities on that. But to me, that was always the distinction between the difference between universities and polytechnics was that universities were supposed to teach people how to uh, you know, a skill, whereas Polytechs was supposed to teach people how to walk into a job. And I think it's sort of sad that the Polytechs have declined in popularity and prestige over the years to the point where... It would seem, okay, so like I said, this is just opinion, but that, that seems to be what, what I'm seeing now. I mean, not in New Zealand. No, no, I'm talking about New Zealand. Polytechnics don't even exist in the States. There's not really any such thing. The closest thing is a junior college. Um, but. But anyway, so I don't know, but one of the things I think is I sort of agree that universities, their obligation is to teach people how to be good software engineers, not necessarily to make sure that they know the languages that you need to know. Whereas, and I don't know, but I would hope that the polytechnics are teaching people sort of skills that they can walk into a job with off straight away. Thanks. Now, have we got another question from the floor? We've always had, already heard one, uh, one bouquet for the immigration service, but uh, no doubt there'll be others, and probably other more negative comments as well. Um, and whether there's advice on how to find a job before or after you get here. Uh, John, does that apply to you when on your way home? Uh, well, I, I ended up getting a job through networks, and that's the, the main lesson I suppose is that you've got to know people. Um, I've done an MBA here in Wellington and there were a lot of people who came in from overseas who said I'm going to get a job, I'm going to finish my MBA, go to a recruitment company, they're going to get me a job. And I asked them, so what did you do in your country? Oh, I knew people. So why did that apply differently here? They thought that, that this was a new place and they could follow the normal rules. But it doesn't. Especially in Wellington it's all about knowing people. 
Um, one thing I will say is the only equal opportunity employer in Wellington is the government. They will give everybody a chance. So, you know, what I told people who were uh, all the shaking of heads over there, um, a lot of foreign people that I know have got uh, jobs with government, they've got bona fide, and then they go out and get um, go and get really good jobs at other com uh, companies. It's happened for my partner, my wife, that's what happened to her. A lot of other people that I know, um, that's what's happened. So um, I think one of the key things you've got to do is if you're out there and people are coming to New Zealand, um, we have to be able to validate who you are and what, and what you can do. So the networks, you know, we've got things like Facebook and people extending across and all that sort of stuff now. So getting to know people through networks and um, LinkedIn and all that good stuff is really, really important. The other thing you can do is obviously you leave a trail on the internet. You